I'm not coordinating the complete rover mission. I'm just coordinating what's called the close-up imager, uh, which is a, a camera like a geologist's hand lens, which is uh, provided by the Space Exploration Institute in Neuchâtel. And the principal investigator is a good friend of mine, and uh, we are working together on getting this instrument on board the rover. But okay, still, it's true. I mean, I'm, I'm basically doing two different things. The one task we want to focus on about today is the work I do in the Planetary Defense Office. It's about near-Earth objects or near-Earth asteroids in particular. And you should be seeing a screen which says the threat from NEOs and what ESA is doing about it. Can you maybe raise your finger, raise your yeah. thumb or something? Yeah. And I do see two, two participants in addition to Stefania also by video. If there were one or two more who would dare to switch on your video, I wouldn't mind because I like to have some visual feedback like Bob is smiling and that helps me in, in giving you a better presentation. It's motivating for the speaker to see some real faces. So don't be shy. Uh, also, if you first need to dress or something, then do that and come back in 10 minutes and then switch on your video. And thanks, Ridai, that you started immediately with your camera on. Really appreciate it. All right, let's get started. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is not too technical or mathematical because I just want to give you an overview of what uh, we at ESA are doing with this topic of what we call planetary defense. At the end of the course, you should, or of this lecture, you should get a feeling for the level of the impact threat. Is there really an impact threat from asteroids? The answer is yes, otherwise we wouldn't be spending money on it but you should have a bit of better feeling of how serious is this issue. You should be aware of who is doing what and what are their main activities? What are the, the players in this field? Of course, it's not just ESA, there are many other parties. Okay, great, one more video. Thanks, Natalie, appreciate it. And uh, the, then I wanted to pick one point where I do get a bit more technical and because you are, looking into say mission analysis and, and orbit design and things like that, I decided to give you again a top level overview of why it is actually difficult to predict the orbits of asteroids. It's not just Kepler ellipsis and we'll talk a bit about that. I split the course in five blocks, not all the same lengths. I think the first two are a bit more uh, in terms of time. I when I test ran this yesterday, it took me about an hour. So let's see how we get through the course today. I'll start with this introduction, which we are right in the middle at. The second part will be about observations. We need to find these objects before we can do anything about them. We will then talk about orbit determination and impact monitoring. I will define what that terminology actually means. We will talk about mitigation. What can we do to reduce the risk from a potential impact? And in the end, I'll cap it all up and uh, summarize and present to you the main players in the community. So let's get started. The first thing is, what is a near-Earth object? Who, who does not, well, let me ask it the other way. Who knows what it is? Don't look at the screen yet. Who knew before you read what I wrote on the screen? I hope at least some of you. Okay, so a near-Earth object is defined as an asteroid or a comet which has a perihelion of less than 1.3 astronomical units. So if you, if you look at my screen here in the background, this is the sun in the middle. I have the blue orbit around it, which is the Earth. That's why it's blue. And actually, normally I look from the top, so everything is going around the sun counterclockwise. And here I have the orbit of an NEO, which is on an elliptical orbit, and it goes to the left where my whiteboard is over. This would qualify as a near-Earth object. I don't really care about this one because it doesn't, well, it does come close to the Earth, but if I think about the scale here, it will still be millions of kilometers away from the Earth and it may never become dangerous. And we'll talk a bit about the difference between a near Earth object and what I call a threatening object, which is an object which has a computed impact probability later. Um, asteroids are cool. 
Stefania mentioned this in the introduction. They're very, very interesting from a scientific scientific point of view because they are leftovers from the formation of the solar system. And comets are in principle the same thing, only they formed much further away from the sun and they contain lots of ices. And that's the definition of a comet is basically when it gets close to the sun, it becomes fuzzy and it gets a tail. And in order to do that, it needs ices, volatile material. But in principle, it's, it's the very same thing. It's small objects, say the largest are a few tens of kilometers in size, at least those that come close to the earth. And uh, we even know many near earth objects now, which are less than 10 meters in size, which may not really pose any threat to our planet, even if they do hit. Most are rocky objects, these asteroids. I mean, the comets are icy. Most of the asteroids are rocky objects. Some can be iron objects, and they are, of course, a bit more dangerous if you have two similar sized objects and one is made of rock, the other one on iron. Guess which one will penetrate the Earth more easily? Of course, the iron object, it's heavier, it has a higher density, but also it's not as brittle. It doesn't break apart as easily. Now, within ESA, we started uh, about 12 years ago. I think my first presentation to this topic was in December 20, uh, sorry, 2007, where we were doing an assessment of what could ESA contribute to this topic of planetary defense, defending our planet from threats uh, outside the Earth. And uh, already in that time, it was agreed that planetary defense would be part of something which we nowadays call space safety program. It used to be space situational awareness program or SSA in case you hear this terminology, but we are now part of the space safety program. The space safety program has the goal to protect our planet, our humanity and assets in space and on earth from dangers originating in space. So that's what I wrote here. Let me get my laser pointed. That's, that's this green part here. And this is what we call our mission statement. That's basically the one sentence that we're trying to fulfill. If you want to summarize my work in one sentence, that's the, the one sentence. I sometimes say, well, we try to save this planet. And I mean, there are other methods to do that or other important things, maybe even more important things right now to save our planet. But this is one of them. This is for the space safety program in general. The space safety has three elements. We're looking at space weather. So if there is a flare on the sun, how does it affect our ionosphere? Uh, you know, it can affect power grids. We're looking at space debris. If you have fragments of satellites, can they hit other satellites? Yes, they can. So we need to be aware of that. And the third segment, as we call it, is this planetary defense segment. And for that in particular, our mission statement broken down is the, the are, that's these three bullets that you read here. We need to be aware of the situation of natural objects in space natural to distinguish it from space debris or satellites. We need to be able to predict possible impacts and their consequences and inform the relevant parties. And we need to prepare for risk mitigation. So that's the three main tasks that we need to do. Before I talk about how we are actually doing it, let me go back and ask again the question, well, is it really relevant? Who cares? I mean, you know, I'll give you the first example here. This is a big impact crater. Who has been there? This is the meteor crater in Arizona. Has anybody visited it? No, I go there. It's really cool. They have a visitor center. There's a road here and there's a nice visitor center. You can visit, uh, you can look into the crater. Uh, it used to be that you can get tours into the crater. I'm not sure whether they still do that, but it's really interesting. This is a 1.5 kilometer crater, which was formed by a 50 meter, 50 meter diameter iron object. Now this was iron. So like I said, that's a lot of energy there. And it came in at, we don't know precisely, but probably 15 to 20 kilometers per second. And then you get this big crater. 
that does not happen very often. I think this thing is, I, I don't remember the number, you'd have to look it up, but it's probably 15,000 years ago that this happened. So you could say, well, look, it hasn't happened since then, so who cares? Well, there are more recent examples. And one example I put here on the right is an image of uh, a crater that was formed just in the year 2007 so a bit over 10, 12 years ago in Carancas in Peru. It's about 15 meters in size, one five now, so a factor of a hundred smaller than the crater on the left. And you see the people in the back there for scale. And this was formed by a 1.5 meter rocky object that went all the way through the atmosphere. And we still are not really sure how such a small object can make it through the atmosphere. And that's not what the scientists were expecting. So that's an interesting case. But it's confirmed that this is material from outer space that came and generated this crater. Because this is a rather low density, low population density area, luckily there wasn't a lot of damage there. Uh, so no problem, but just visualize that this hits somewhere in the middle of London, what well, you would want to know before this comes and at least evacuate the people or do something else about it, right? And that's exactly what we're trying to do in our planetary defense office. And the lower image here, uh, we this is the so-called Chelyabinsk event that happened in the year 2013 in February. A 20 meter object, two zero meters in diameter, roughly, uh, entered the atmosphere over Chelyabinsk and it generated a shock wave that actually did some damage. And I have, uh, let's see, I put a little YouTube video here. Again, you can look at this yourself then, but let's just start this. I hope you can see it. Uh, now I can't see it. Now, there we go. Let me see. So, yeah, you get that? So they showed the, the smoke trail or the clouds that, that were generated when the object entered. And then, of course, the shockwave only comes a few minutes after the entry. So people would go outside, and those were the lucky ones. Those that were standing behind their windows in a building like this were unlucky because the shockwave comes and then basically blows the glass of the windows in your face. So visualize yourself saying, oh God, what the hell is happening out there? And then suddenly plum, you get all the glass in your face. There were 1500 people which were injured with this event. And again, if we knew this before, we could do something about it. And that's why we are here. And that's why I get some salary paid. How does it happen? Uh, just a table here. I'll just give you a few examples. So I have, for some reason, 20 meters is not on here. But 10 meter objects happen on average. I mean, this is a statistical long-term average, say, every five years. And a 10 meter object would probably not reach the ground. It uh, will generate some small meteorites and it will be quite bright. It will be brighter than the sun. And we would expect that people will start asking the question, what the hell is happening there? A 40 meter object is something that happened in the Tunguska region about a hundred years ago. That typically ha happens every few hundred years. Now, 20 meters would be somewhere in the middle. So say something like Chelyabinsk could happen on average every 50 to 100 years. Now keep in mind, this is statistics and statistics is nasty. Uh, out of these 20 meter objects, we basically know none of them out there in the solar system. We know less than 0.1% of the complete population. So this could still happen again tomorrow. We just don't know just like the Chelyabinsk object, which came from the direction of the sun, we didn't realize it was there until it entered the Earth's atmosphere. Larger objects, 140 meters, would do regional destruction. Uh, these don't happen very often. Again, it's statistics, so it still can happen within our lifetime. And these are then the objects where we would probably want to deflect the asteroid 
uh, like with the uh, DART or HERA mission that Stefania mentioned in the beginning. Now, how do we do this? Well, we have something called a planetary defense office at ESA. And before you ask questions, of course, at least NASA has something very similar and they were there a bit before us actually. And NASA was the one who started working on this whole topic uh, long before everybody else. I think ESA then joined quite quickly. And uh, now we have, just as NASA has a planetary defense office only spelled with an S, we have a planetary defense office where defense is spelled with a Z. And with the exception of the funding, which is much smaller on our side than NASA's side, the setup is very similar. We focus on three different pillars, as I call them. That's observations, it's information provision, which includes computing orbits, predicting impacts, and it's addressing mitigation. And these three pillars stand on a common platform, which we call ground and data systems. So we would have like IT support, of course, or people that know about optical telescopes. Uh, there we call in experts from ESA who are provided to us from uh, outside our own office. In total, we have currently 13, one, three people working in the office, and typically we are hiring one or two additional people every year. Uh, but it's, it's not a big office, it's really just a small project within ESA. We have a web page, so if you want to do some research on your own, it's at neo.ssa.esa.int, so Near Earth Object, SSA, still from Space Situational Awareness, and uh, go there and you find all the information. Everything we do is public, and that's on purpose because it's very hard to keep things secret when it comes to asteroids. There are a lot of amateur astronomers out there that look at the sky just like the professionals do. Okay, they have smaller telescopes, but still, if an object is close, then it gets bright and it's visible even by an amateur. There are people out there that do uh, work like orbit predictions, which is really at the same level as professionals. I mean, there's an amateur who is a math professor, and of course he is good in computing orbits, better than me because I'm not good in math. So that's why it's clear that there is nothing secret or no, we are not working with the military or anything. It's actually quite... Uh, satisfying if you work on an international level that we work together with the Chinese, with the Japanese, with Koreans and Americans, and we just all talk together and we know that there is something coming from the outside. And only if we work together, we can defend ourselves properly. All right, that was a bit the top level overview. So do you have any questions to this top level part? I saw a shaking head. So let me just jump into the second block called observations. The first thing you have to know is we talk about two different kinds of observations in this field of asteroids. Well, the first thing is I'm currently only talking about optical observations. So with optical telescopes that just use a regular CCD or CMOS camera to look at the night sky. And what we have is we have something called survey observation, and we have something called follow-up observations. And in the space debris field, what we call follow-up, they call tracking. So it's the same thing. When they talk about tracking, I call it follow-up. That's really the same thing. And surveys are currently performed by three main programs. All of them are funded by our American colleagues, by NASA. The biggest survey is called PANSTARS. They have two 1.8 meter telescopes on Hawaii. And there's the Catalina Sky Survey in Arizona, and there's something called ATLAS also in Hawaii. All of these telescopes are not super big in aperture. I mean, astronomers start thinking large is everything larger than eight meters, and they smile at people that use smaller telescopes. Well, the Catalina telescope, the largest one is one meter and the other one has 80 centimeters aperture. Um, the important thing is we have a very, very large field of view. 
so pun stars i forgot the details but it covers like a, a field of view of 2.5 by 2.5 degrees in the sky if not more i know the numbers for our own telescope i'll address that later because we want to cover as much as we can of the night sky per night so that we don't miss an object you know we look there and the, an object comes close on the other side we want to avoid that we on ESA side are currently building a telescope it's almost done I mean I've seen all the hardware with the exception of some of the cameras already it's built in Italy by the company OHB in Italy it's a one meter telescope with a field of view of almost seven by seven degrees so if you think of the full moon in the sky you could put the the full moon 150 times into the field of view so we take one image and we cover 150 times the area of the full moon that sounds like a lot but still if you want to cover the complete night sky you would need to spend three or four nights with this one telescope to do it our goal is to just spend one night so the conclusion is we need three to four telescopes to do that and we have funding to start the second one and third and fourth will hopefully come in the future. The next thing is follow-up observations. So once you have an object discovered, you, you observe the object maybe for one hour. Now again, think, think of the orbit. So even if you have an orbit very similar to the Earth's orbit, it takes one year to, to go around the sun. So if you only observe the object for one hour and you want to compute the orbit, your uncertainties are huge. Normally it's just enough to find out where the object is in the sky for say the next few hours. And if you then don't observe it again, it can be anywhere in the sky and you'll never find it again. That's why uh, what happens is after an object is discovered, people out there point their own telescopes or you know robotic telescopes whatever and dedicate the observations to following up this one particular object which was newly discovered on ESA side we use our what we call the optical ground station again it's a one meter telescope in the canary islands and then we have contracts with a number of european telescopes but also telescopes on the southern hemisphere and we have access to quite large telescopes, for example, the very large telescope in Chile of the European Southern Observatory that now is an 8.2 meter telescope. And we have an agreement that we can use that for observing the, the really faint objects which are still or could be dangerous. And where we can argue that if we don't observe it with this large telescope, they may come out of nowhere at some point and uh, threaten us. So that's what we currently focus on, these follow-up observations. Survey observations are funded by NASA, but also on ESA side, we will come to that. Just a, a little animation here to explain this. <coughs> Why do we need these follow-up observations? I hope it's already clear to you. I'll give you an example in a minute. Uh, the survey telescopes typically look at the same part in the sky three to four times or even five times spaced 10 minutes apart. So I get a number of observations here. It looks like one observation is missing. Maybe the object was very close to a bright star. So now I have three observations spaced 10 minutes apart of the object in the sky. And with that, I can compute an orbit and predict where the object should be, say in a few hours from now. And uh, I do this prediction. And ta-da, I have a nice prediction. Now already I know that when measuring the position of the objects, I make errors, it's uncertain. And I can take these uncertainties into account and compute an uncertainty ellipse. So what I should be doing with my follow-up telescope, I should just observe this uncertainty ellipse. And then I may find out, ah, this is where the object really is. It's not at the predicted position. It's still somewhere in the uncertainty ellipse. So that means our math was right. And now if I do an updated orbit, you see the fit here in the first three points is looks like the same quality as it was before. But now I end up at a completely different location if I say now extrapolate that to tomorrow or to a week from now. 
that's just to illustrate why these follow-up observations are so important. Now, other than asteroids, part of our program, we also observe fireballs and the moon. Let me try to click on this and see whether I get this running. Uh, just a second, it's loading. Yes, so there we are. Look at the upper right here. And there you see this, this bright thing entering the atmosphere. And it was really bright. This one is a cool one. I'll come back to this. This was an event that we actually predicted. We observed the object in space and then we could say, okay, this will enter somewhere over Africa. And then afterwards, oops, somewhere. stop the video here. And then sometime later, uh, we, after we observed the object in space, we found this recording of a webcam somewhere in Africa. So this, this is one thing we're looking at. The other thing we're looking at is the impact flashes on the moon. Also there I have a little movie here on the upper left. You see that if you look at the dark side of the moon, so the bright side, the illuminated side is on the bottom part here. This is the dark side, which you normally, well, it faces the Earth, of course. This is, say, at half moon. So half of the moon is bright, the other half is dark. That's where you want to look. And then you occasionally see these light flashes there. These come from, I think this flash may be just from an object a few centimeters in size, like this one. Maybe it's 20 centimeters. We're still discussing the size conversion here. But this also tells you a lot about the frequency these objects hit our planet, because from the moon, of course, you can extrapolate what happens on our planet. So that's another part of the observational activities that we're involved in. And that's all I have to say for observations. Do you have any questions to the observations? Yes, Bob, go ahead. If I uh, understand correctly, uh, from B612, um, you know, the, the uh, organization uh, B612, they were talking about putting a, a spacecraft around the orbit of Venus, I think it was, to look, and because they claimed that they could possibly see um, incoming objects, which we couldn't see from the Earth. Is that correct? Yeah, no, that, that's a good point worth mentioning. Uh, currently, we do not have any approved projects to put a telescope in space to observe asteroids. NASA is very close. Uh, they, they have plans for that, which are very concrete. It's called NEOSM, N-E-O-S-M, which stands for NEO Survey Mission. And this is the closest to what I guess the idea of the B612 Foundation was. You take a telescope, Neosom would be in Earth orbit actually, or I think in one of the Lagrange points, and uh, scan the sky from there. Now, why would you want to go to space? Remember what I mentioned about the Chelyabinsk object, which came basically from the direction of the sun when it entered the Earth's atmosphere. And uh, so directly before it entered the atmosphere from, from ground, you would not be able to observe it because it's in daylight. Now, we, we backward propagated the orbit to check whether maybe we could have seen it at the previous flyby. Yeah, I mean, these objects don't just fly by once. I mean, this thing goes around and then a few years later, it comes back again. So could we have seen it at the previous close flyby? And the answer is no. The object that hit uh, the atmosphere in 2013 at Chelyabinsk was never bright enough to be visible with our telescopes. I mean, we computed 40 years backwards in time. And then, you know, there is a limit to the telescope size 40 years ago. So it would have been impossible to detect it. If you go in space, then of course you can see these objects. And the reason why B612 is proposing to go to a Venus type orbit is, then you have the sun in the back and you can look out with your sun in the back and you see even these objects which are closer to the sun as seen from the earth. And they're nicely illuminated, well illuminated. Yeah, like, like this one here. If, if I'm the sun, all you would see is black. But if the object is behind me, then you would see it illuminated. 
So this is why Venus, a Venus-like orbit would be fantastic. Uh, like I said, the best we are doing right now is this NEOSAM project, which I think is a 40 centimeter telescope, uh, which is very close to, uh, to getting funded for a launch. It's not yet confirmed, but they are very far advanced already. The other project to mention maybe is, is called NEOWISE. The Americans had a, a white infrared sky survey telescope, which was looking at the sky in the thermal infrared. And when the official science mission was over, the NASA Planetary Defense Office took over the mission and uh, they didn't have cooling capacities anymore, but you could still observe in two or three thermal spectral bands in the thermal infrared. And they used that to identify asteroids and in the infrared you can directly measure the size of the object which in the optical we cannot so that was really useful but that's currently not as far as i remember it's it's stopped also so it's really important to have another space-based telescope in europe spain is currently very interested they said they want to look into this we, we are starting some studies with spain and then hopefully when we go to the next ministerial conference in 22, we can ask for some more funding to do a better study on that, but it's only studies for now. Okay. Thank you. All right, then let's continue with uh, <clears throat> the next part, which is called orbit determination and impact monitoring. So let's first say what, what is orbit determination? Well. That's what uh, I illustrated already a bit here. When you see an object in the sky, then all you see is something moving between the stars. This is a typical image on the left here from a survey, or in this case was a follow-up telescope. You see the stars are slightly trailed, so somebody already knew the object is moving in this direction, and then tracked the object to increase the signal to noise. This, I don't know the details, is from Tautenburg. Okay, they typically take images every 10 to 15 minutes. And you see the stars are always at the same location. This thing moves. Now, of course, if you, if you measure the position now of the asteroid, you get it in celestial coordinates, in right ascension and declination, simply relative to the stars. And then if you do a lot of math, you can convert that so a coordinate system in our solar system. Yeah, this right ascension and declination is essentially a direction somewhere in the sky from your telescope. And with that, you can compute the orbit. In the simplest case, you assume it's a Kepler ellipse. And then already Gauss came up many years ago with a way to solve this problem and come up with an orbit, which you see on the right side. Let me switch on my laser pointer again. So we go from these measurements to an orbit of an object here. Uh, this is the asteroid orbit. This one has a close flyby at the Earth. So you actually see two different orbits. One is before the close flyby. The other one is after the close flyby. So you already see just assuming a Kepler ellipse may not be good enough because in particular for those objects that come close to the Earth, you need to take Earth's gravity into account. But okay, just to get started, all you do is you look at the object here and you compute an orbit. And again, just to, to visualize how that's done, I spare you the math today, but in principle, I hope it's all clear to you what we're doing. Let me show you my screen, my whiteboard a bit. So I have, now I have the sun in the middle and I just assume some kind of coordinate system, normally solar system, barycentered. Then I have the Earth orbiting around like this. So here I have my planet. <coughs> if I have a telescope and it looks say in this direction, that's the direction of where I see the asteroid. Right ascension and declination simply is this direction. I do not know the length. That's, of course, difficult to obtain if all I have is a dot in the sky. I have no clue how far away it is. But if I now have 
three of these observations, and I know that the orbit should be a Kepler ellipse, then if I'm lucky, I can fit an orbit around this. In reality, unfortunately, it doesn't work <laughs> because the, the observational arc, as we call it, the time that we observe is always, like I said, maybe an hour or so. So that's why we again need these follow-up observations. Then if I have a few days of observations, then we can say, okay, now the orbit is good enough that it will last at least say a year or so, and I can still find the object back. And there are a number of techniques now, like systematic ranging. I mentioned Gauss, Laplace also worked on this. The systematic ranging is quite uh, recent where you do a statistical analysis taking the uncertainties of the observations into account and with that hopefully get a reasonable assumption for a starting orbit. So if you're interested in math, that's a fantastic field to play with. Uh, in Europe, the key institution there for us, for ESA, was the University of Pisa. They developed a lot of orbit determination software, which we have taken over and modified and are now running in our own system. Well, that's not a trivial thing. Now, even when we have a lot of observations, uh, orbit determination is challenging. Um, you know, we have planetary perturbations. Remember the object I showed before where uh, we had these two orbits. When it passes by the Earth, then the orbit completely changes. The semi-major axis changed a lot. There's something else which is relevant. Well, there's relativistic effects. If you have an object coming closer to the sun than say halfway between Mercury and Venus, you have to take relativistic effects into account. The other effect is the Yarkovsky effect. Visualize, this is my asteroid. See yourself as the sun and the sun sends a lot of energy and you heat up the asteroid. Now assume the thermal inertia of this object is infinite. So it, it doesn't really heat up. It will re-radiate all this energy towards you. And that's enough to, to act, uh, to, to force the object away from the sun. Now in real life, the object is rotating. So if I heat it up here, it's rotating like this. It will send its, uh, its uh, light or its energy a bit under an angle. And that's illustrated here. So I have the sun at the bottom, I have the asteroid here. It rotates counterclockwise in this drawing. The infrared re-radiation will go in the direction indicated by the wiggly lines, and that will increase the semi-major axis of the object. And if it rotates the other way around, it would decrease the semi-major axis. And this whole effect is a function of the thermal inertia. If I have infinite thermal inertia, it will just re-radiate in all directions and then, you know, then it's no problem. So that's uh, one of the, surprisingly, in my view, one of the most important things that we need to consider in addition to uh, relativistic effects and planetary perturbations when we do orbital analysis. Just to give you some numbers, a uh, hopefully well-known asteroid is asteroid Apophis. It was discovered in the year 2004 and uh, was predicted to hit the Earth with something like 5% probability or so, which then in the end, um, it turned out that that was just an uncertainty in the time measurements. So very quickly that impact threat went away. Still, it will have a very close flyby to our planet in the year 2029. So eight years from now, hopefully we'll all see that. It will become visible with the naked eye. It's brighter than what you can see with the naked eye. So that's good. It will be visible from Southern Europe or even from Central Europe, I think, uh, in the evening on the Friday. So it's really cool, best television time. Let's hope Starlink satellites will not uh, block the view, but okay, I'll be there. <coughs> now we can predict the flyby distance it will be below the geostationary belt, about 30,000 kilometers from the Earth. And we can predict this to a few kilometers accuracy if we just assume gravitation. But 
because of the Yarkovsky effect, we suddenly have an uncertainty of three to 400 kilometers. We know it, the object uh, shows the Yarkovsky effect. We know which way it's rotating. So we know that the distance that we compute from, uh, from just gravity is the, the maximum distance, but it could be closer than that by up to 400 kilometers. And we don't precisely know simply because we don't know the details of the Yarkovsky effect. And that's a bit annoying because of course, when it flies by the earth, again, the orbit is completely changed and where precisely it will fly by will determine whether we will have an impact solution in 2068. And we will just not know until after the flyby. So that's why it's difficult to determine these orbits. And to the right, again, I show a plot where one of these orbits, now don't ask me which one is which, but one of these lines is the orbit before the flyby and the other one is after the flyby. And you see before it's, it's not getting much further than the earth. Whereas after, I think it's after, uh, it goes almost all the way out to Mars. Maybe it was the other way around, I don't remember. Okay, now, any questions to this orbit determination? What are we doing with time? Yeah, I think it's still some time, right? Yes, excuse me, good morning, Roberto Camagno speaking. Hi, good morning. Uh, I, have a, I have a question. You, you briefly touched uh, uh, while you were talking uh, the matter related to Starlink and other internet broadband constellation that sooner will be, will be in the sky, will be in, the, in orbit. Uh, do you believe that this could be a real problem in the observation of near Earth objects in the future? Thank you. I am not yet sure, to be honest. There, uh, there was a paper recently published by a colleague from the European Southern Observatory who, among other things, looked at the survey capabilities of the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, part of the Vera Rubin Observatory. That will, it's currently being, well, being not yet commissioned. They're just finishing building the telescope and building the hardware. And they do a scientific survey of the night sky uh, for science reasons now, not so much for asteroids, they will of course also see asteroids. And there, if I remember the number correctly, uh, they will lose about 10% of the observations or five to 10% of the observations if Starlink continues without doing any mitigating activities like you know, painting things black or something. Uh, they will lose five to 10% of their observations. That means instead of 10 years, they have to observe 11 years to fulfill their survey goal. And one year of operations costs a few tens of millions of euros. So that's the impact there. Now for us, it's, it's not yet clear to me. We, we asked the same guy who wrote this paper to also take the data from our survey telescope that we are currently developing. And he came up with numbers where we had like two or 3% of observations, which we lose. But it always depends on your detection algorithm, which is not yet tested. So the, the honest answer is, I don't know yet. I am worried, but I cannot yet really prove how much observations we will lose. We will lose some, that's for sure. It will be annoying because you will have false detections from these satellites going through. Uh, but maybe, you know, if I know the direction they fly through, I can change my software so everything that goes above a certain speed, I mean, they will be rather fast, faster than most of our asteroids. Maybe I can exclude them by software. So it's something we're following closely, but I don't have a clear answer for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question, please. It's Victor Barr. Hi, Victor. Um, I, I wondered if it's possible uh, to compare the observed orbit of an asteroid, uh, to compare it to the calculated orbit, and from the difference, uh, is it possible to calculate the thermal inertia and constrain the asteroid type? That's one of the things that was done for Apophis. And there are a number of other objects. And now we get even more with Gaia measurements where we have very precise measurements of some asteroids. And we can detect the Yarkovsky effect that way. 
Um, now, I'm not the super duper expert there, but if I remember correctly of what my colleagues told me, it's, it's possible to detect the effect and say, okay, you know, you change the semi-major axis by blah, blah, blah over this period of time, but it's now very difficult to disentangle or find a unique solution of the influence of say the size of the object, the rotational speed and direction of the object and the properties of the object. So this is why we still, for example, for Apophis have this uncertainty of a few hundred kilometers. We know it shows the Yarkovsky effect. There were some solutions. We know the size of the object. We have a reasonable idea of the rotational speed. Still, I have this uncertainty. My suspicion, I was asking myself the same question. If we know all these things, why do we still have this uncertainty? And my suspicion there is this is because we do not know the thermal inertia well enough. So most likely, you know, even if you observe these objects, we cannot uniquely measure or derive all the quantities that we would need to do a prediction very far in the future. But the more we work on that, the, the easier it will become. But we're just beginning with these Yarkovsky measurements. They have been done, well, for a few tens of years, this was known, but that we get really precise measurements. I think this is starting now with Gaia observations where we get super precise position measurements. So hopefully in 10 or 20 years, I can answer to your question. Yes, of course, we can measure everything. We're not yet there. Thank you. Okay, then let me go to the next block, which is called mitigation. The first thing I want to clarify is the definition of the term mitigation. I keep seeing colleagues that say, oh, we built a mitigation mission. And what they really mean is a deflection mission. Uh, I looked up what mitigation means, and in the Webster online dictionary, it says mitigation is the action of reducing the severity, seriousness, or painfulness of something. So it doesn't mean if I want to mitigate the threat of an asteroid impact that I have to blow up the asteroid. That's not necessarily needed. Uh, warning the public can be good enough. Think back to the case of Chelyabinsk. Yeah, I think I, I have that here. If I had seen this coming, the way to do it is we would have told the local emergency response agency, hey guys, there is an object coming that will light up the sky tomorrow morning. We predict that all that will happen is that there's a shock wave which could shatter windows. So please make sure people open their windows and just leave them open until the shock wave is gone and then close them again and go outside and enjoy the show. And then nothing would have happened. Well, okay, some people, of course, don't listen and, and still do it and look behind the window. But in principle, you know, you, you distribute this information via the radio or television the evening before. You say, hey, look, something fantastic is happening tomorrow, but please don't stand behind your closed window because otherwise you may get glass in your face. And then nobody would have hurt, have gotten hurt. And that's a bit one of the things we're looking at for objects, in particular objects smaller than 50 meters in size, five zero meters. That's where we would not even think about a deflection mission. We would think about maybe a surveillance mission. You know, if I have a 40 meter object, which is made of iron, it's very close in size to this Arizona meteor crater which I want to avoid. So, I mean, there I would think maybe we should deflect this thing because it's a 1.5 kilometer crater somewhere in the desert, luckily. But if this happens in Europe, that would be bad. And it's difficult to evacuate all of Europe. Where would we go? Uh, so maybe we send a surveillance mission there to, just to see what it's made of. Uh, but be clear that mitigation doesn't immediately mean deflection. And the two screenshots I have here, I just want to point out, maybe some of you recognize them. 
The left one is a scene from the movie Deep Impact, and the right one is a movie from Armageddon, where Bruce Willis flew with two space shuttles to this gigantic asteroid, blew it up just before it came close to the Earth, and there were two fragments, and one flew to the left, and the other one flew to the right. I don't think it would work that way, but it's still a fun movie to watch. So that's why I thought it's a good example here. Deep Impact is a bit more down to earth, more realistic, I think. And in the end, they focus their activities on evacuation. As you can see, that has its challenges. Here, the roads were fully blocked and people didn't get away in time. Uh, we were told by emergency response agencies that if they needed to evacuate a city, they would want to have about 10 days in advance. And in principle, they would like to have three weeks in advance because a factor of two is always a good safety factor. And this is how we designed our survey telescope. Our survey telescope is capable of observing objects down to 21.5 stellar magnitudes. And if I convert that to a size of an object at a typical distance, it would correspond to a distance, uh, sorry, to a size of about 40 meters. So just like the Tunguska object, uh, when it's three weeks away from our planet, taking average relative velocities and things like that. So that's uh, how things fall together. With our survey, once it's up and running, we can warn people three weeks in advance about something that's Tunguska sized or larger. Of course, in detail, it depends. Uh, it's, it could be a 20 meter object that we discover 10 days in, an, in advance, we could still do something about it. So that's mitigation, two things. It can be just warning the public and then it's up to the emergency response agencies. We don't tell the people what to do. We just inform the emergency response agencies. The space agency cannot say you should evacuate. That's not up to us. We leave that to the emergency response agencies. For objects larger than 50 meters, we will all become active and think about possible asteroid deflection. How do we tell people? Uh, if you go to our web page again, NEOSSA ESA INT, you will find a menu bar on the left, which is called CAFS, C A F S. Well, we just love acronyms. CAFS stands for Close Approaches Fact Sheet. We generate one of these close approaches fact sheet for every close flyby, which would result in an object which, an, which has an apparent magnitude brighter than 11. So that's cool because that means if I have a large object, I would get this fact sheet or a warning effectively already at larger distances. Whereas if it's just a five meter object, it has to become really close. It has to be really close before we become active. So that's what we do. And I give you an example here. You see the top half of this close approaches fact sheet with a nice visual design following the ESA rules from five years ago. I think we have to change the logo actually. We now have a solid logo. And uh, there is some information. It says, okay, a small asteroid impacted the Earth. So here you see, this is already an update that was after an object actually hit our planet. That was on the 2nd of June, 2018, sometime in the afternoon, our time with a, this should read impact speed. We have updated this now. It's not flying by anymore if it impacted of 17 kilometers per second and the size was two to five meters. So that's so small that uh, only small pieces reach the ground. Yeah, again, I think they actually found a meteorite which was roughly this size, maybe only half the size and probably a few other pieces were there but they didn't find them. We provide the orbital information and some other information like what are the expected impact effects. <clears throat> and in the case like this one, when it's actually predicted to impact, we also provide an impact corridor. So this line here, which is red in the middle and green on the outside, that's the, I think the red is the one sigma and the green is the three sigma uncertainty ellipse of the impact corridor. 
we, you know, what you have to see is you have your asteroid, it comes close to the Earth. And one, one of the things we know very well is the plane of the orbit. So that's known very, very precisely. And that defines the long axis of this ellipse. This is essentially a projection of the orbital plane of the asteroid onto the Earth's surface. And it's a bit curved because the Earth is a sphere. What we don't know very precisely is where the object is in its plane. Or take it the other way around, we don't know precisely the timing. And if this object is just one minute earlier or one minute later, remember I said the relative velocity is 17 kilometers per second. So let's call it 20 kilometers times 60 is then already a thousand kilometers within one minute that this thing would move around. And that was about the uncertainty here for this object. We, we had uh, say tens of seconds or a couple of minutes and then you get this uncertainty here. And in the end, I already showed you this video at the beginning. Uh, the entry of this object was recorded. I think it was uh, still in Botswana or close to the border to Botswana, somewhere here. So in this part, so not in the middle of the impact corridor, but somewhere in this part. So that showed quite nicely that our computations work and uh, the uncertainties are as they are. This object was discovered just a few hours before it hit. Of course, if I have more observations, then I would probably be able to reduce the length of this impact corridor a bit, but I wouldn't be too optimistic there. So that's what we now can tell emergency response agencies. And we are currently setting up interfaces to our European emergency response agencies. We have a test run with the German, they call it Weltraum Lagezentrum, which is the German Space Situational Awareness Center. And they in turn talk to the Ministry of Interior where they, they set up these defense things and emergency response things. And we plan to do an end-to-end -end simulation run with them in March this year, where we basically set up a fake impact scenario and then you know they inform the people and then hopefully the people know what to do and if they don't know what to do that means we need to train them so we had workshops with emergency response agencies where we were teaching them okay look this is what we can do these are the accuracies and inaccuracies these are our limitations this is what we expect and then we ask them what do you want to hear from us what kind of information do you need and when do you need it we're setting up this interface right now. We're, we're not yet there. If something, if a real thing happened next week, we would not yet be really ready, but we are working on it. And similar activity is going on on a truly international context. We uh, were participating in discussions, I think since 2008, I was involved in discussions on the level of the United Nations. They have something called COPUOS, this acronym here, and that's the Committee of Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. And they are dealing with this topic of near Earth objects. And they endorsed two international groups. These are not United Nations groups. They're just groups that formed by themselves, but they're endorsed by the United Nations. And we report to the United Nations. Group number one is called International Asteroid Warning Network. The acronym, we pronounce that I1. And there's something called Space Mission Planning Advisory Group. We pronounce that same page. I1 is basically a loose network of all individual groups and institutions who observe asteroids, compute their impact probabilities, compute the effects, what happens if this thing actually happened. And the Space Mission Planning Advisory Group consists of delegations of all spacefaring nations or the space agencies. They become active if an object has an impact probability larger than 1% and the size of larger than 50 meters. And think about how could we deflect this? And of course, something like the DART mission that Stefania mentioned and Hera where we want to test a deflection of an asteroid, they're very, very important for the work that we do here. If we find an impact threat, 
we will inform USA. That's this acronym here. USA stands for Office of Outer Space Affairs. That's in essence the Secretariat of COPOS, and they are in. They have uh, political contacts by what they call a note verbal to all the member countries. So if you predicted an impact, say over Sri Lanka, we inform this group here, they would inform the Office of Outer Space Affairs and they will contact the Ministry for External Relations of Sri Lanka. And that's how we ensure that the information flows. All right, uh, so let me wrap up the whole thing and then I hope you still have some time for questions. So the overall context, I showed you all the bits and pieces, but let me now put it together. So this is my block diagram that I've been showing to people for, well, 10 years. This is an update from 2017, uh, but it's actually quite old. You have an asteroid here, your near Earth object. The first thing you do is you have to observe it. And uh, we have our own telescopes, like the optical ground station or our survey telescope, which we are currently developing. But we can also work with existing telescope facilities via service level agreements and things like that. The one thing I hadn't mentioned yet, all positional observations, I'm only talking positions now, so the astrometry is collected by one place on this planet called the Minor Planet Center. It's physically located in the US, funded by NASA. It's the one single place on this planet where all these observations are collected. They will decide whether an object's orbit has been determined well enough that we can actually call it near Earth object or not. So what they're doing is whenever they get observations, the first thing is they check do these observations fit to an object that's already there? If not, they compute an orbit with all the culprits that I mentioned that it will be very uncertain and make a prediction on where you have to look to do your follow-up observations. They post that on a web page, which is called NEO confirmation page. And then anybody can go there, you know, Detlef, the amateur astronomer who has a telescope in his backyard can go to that page and say, oh yeah, this object is bright enough that I could see it with my telescope. And then I can do follow-up observations. But again, I will submit by email. It's a simple email interface to the Minor Planet Center, my observations. And then they update the orbit computations until they decide that the orbit is good enough that we can actually see the object, say, for the next year or so. Now, once that has happened, we have a group, which I go back one slide here. This is happening in our planetary defense office. We have something called the SSA NEO Coordination Center, physically located at ESRIN in Italy. And that's one of the two places on this planet where we now recompute these orbits. We, we again go back to the original measurements and we now do a very, very high fidelity computation, very sophisticated for certain objects that can run five, six hours. And with that, we now very precisely know where the object will be. And we predict the position, we propagate it 100 years in the future. And then the second part is what we call impact monitoring with this propagation into the future, we now compare it to the distance to our own planet and come up with impact probabilities. We have this uncertainty ellipse of where the object could be. And then if it intersects with the Earth, then from the ratio of this intersection area and the complete ellipse, I compute an impact probability. That's what we call impact monitoring. And once that's done, uh, what I just mentioned a few slides ago, this political process becomes active that if we have an impact solution, which is above a certain threshold, uh, then we would inform the emergency response agencies or go to the United Nations. I summarize that in a slightly different form on this view graph, just to make sure it's really clear. So just to repeat, I have a survey telescope like PANSTARS, it measures the position of the object in the sky. All the information is collected by the Minor Planet Center. They compute a preliminary orbit. 
if this is a possible near Earth object, they post the information on this annual confirmation page. Everybody on this planet who is in the field will try to get follow up observations. They do a recomputation of the orbit. So this goes in a loop typically for three or four days. Then we have a good enough orbit. And then other systems come into play, like our NEO Coordination Center. And there are two more. Again, there's still the system at the University of Pisa, which I mentioned, which we inherited more or less in an upgraded version. And there is an independent system at JPL, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory of NASA. And if there is an object which has a certain impact probability or larger, then we don't just publish this information. Actually, the software then decides not to publish anything, but it will send an email to the operators and say, look, there is a high probability impact object here. Now we have to intervene manually and we double check with our NASA colleagues whether they have similar results. We will never have exactly the same because it's different software they use. But if they also have something on a high level, only then we publish this information and vice versa. If NASA uh, discovers an object with a certain impact probability which exceeds a certain threshold, they will ask us. Typically, we are the first simply because of the way day and night work on this planet. But uh, that's a, a self-built in control mechanism that we don't just publish something because we made a mistake in some computations. <coughs> so that's a bit the whole process. <coughs> And then, as I said before, just to recap, uh, if we find an object which impacts either for certain or has a certain threshold, I think we use the 1% over the next 50 years is the threshold where we inform emergency response agencies. And then if in addition, the object is larger than 50 meters in size, then we also have to think about possible deflection missions. HERA was mentioned by Stefania is part of a mission called AIDA, which stands for Asteroid Impact Deflection Assessment. That's uh, NASA will be basically shooting a satellite into the smaller one of a binary asteroid. And then you can just visualize this. This is my asteroid here, my satellite here, my asteroid. If I hit the asteroid, the asteroid will be pushed a bit just by conversation of momentum, we will change the velocity. Now, the, the trick with this double asteroid is that if you have two objects, they orbit each other and you can measure the orbital period very precisely. So even a small change in velocity can super easily be measured. And that's what we're doing here. So the satellite is very small, it's just a few hundred kilograms. It wouldn't be able to deflect a really threatening object. But since this is just a demonstration, we also want to avoid that we accidentally push something towards our planet. This is a perfect demonstration for this. And that's it from my side. Uh, I'll be ready for answering more questions if you're still willing to ask some or have some time. Stefania has a copy of my view graphs and I just want to let you know that for each of these five blocks that I have, I have a number of questions and if you want to go through the effort, did you really understand it? Uh, as go through these questions. And if you want, I'd be happy to check your replies and uh, make sure that you answer them correctly. But that should all go through Stefania, then she will coordinate that if you're interested. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for your talk. So uh, on the back of this, I'm going to leave my email in the chat so you can uh, email me and ask me the presentation if you want. Mm -hmm. Do you have, is there any question? Something you're curious about? Yeah, Natalie is raising her hand yeah. and then Rob. Sure. Yes, I actually have two questions. Uh, one is regarding observations. Is there any way you can observe them in infrared or any other spectra than optical? Probably not. Well, the answer is yes, it is possible. I mean, there are infrared cap capabilities on ground. We have the IRTF on Hawaii, which is occasionally used for observing asteroids. 
And I mentioned the, the Neowise mission, which is space-based. And that was a very important asset because uh, one of the things I didn't discuss at all is the, all we normally see with our optical telescope is a point. We cannot resolve these objects unless I use super special techniques uh, on the very large telescope. So in order to estimate the size, I need to know how much light does it reflect, which I don't know. I mean, we have estimates it can be anywhere between four and 40%, which means the size uncertainty is, is a factor of two. Whereas if I observe in the thermal infrared, and that was done with Neowise, I immediately see the size of the object because basically all I measure is the temperature and then with the intensity, I can compute the size of the object directly. That's why these infrared observations would be very, very important. But this thermal infrared, you can only do space-based. I think there were observations done by Spitzer, which is another space-based infrared telescope and Neowise, and uh, we would need more. So the answer is yes, it is possible. It's no problem, but you need a telescope somewhere that does it and preferably in space. Since we're at that, one more point before you ask is there you can also see asteroids using radar systems. And before the Arecibo radar crashed down, it was one of the major assets uh, that was used on this planet to look at asteroids. That only works if you have asteroids coming really close, say, well, really close, okay, two to three million kilometers. Otherwise, the signal strength was not enough. But that would give you the size quite directly. And you can also determine the dielectric constant of the surface of the asteroid, which will tell you whether it's an iron or a rocky object. Now that's more difficult now with Arecibo gone. Goldstone is still there, but it's smaller. So we'll see how that goes. Okay, question number two. Um, question number two is, I might have missed it. Uh, how much time do you have uh, to inform once you know that there's a potential threat and you want to inform uh, first responders and everything? How much time do you have for that? Uh, well, this depends, of course, on the object itself. For Chelyabinsk, the time was zero. We saw it entering the atmosphere, and that's when we could have informed the people. For other objects, maybe a good example is to just go to our web page and look at something we call the risk list. So I'm putting that on my screen now. Our web page has a button called risk page. And uh, that shows you the objects. This is now sorted by what we call the, the Palermo scale, which is a measure of how serious the impact threat is. Here's an object 2010 RF12, which will impact in 2095. So there I still have a few years. And I just was queried by the press for this object here, 29JF1, which will has a predicted impact for 2022. So that's only one and a half years from now. But it turns out that this actually is quite uncertain because it hasn't been observed for many years. So the warning times vary a lot. It could be just a few hours, like in the one example where I showed you the impact corridor over Africa, up to many, many years. Now, typically, the larger objects I see many, many years in advance, because when they are large, they are bright, even when they are far away. For the small objects, if I'm lucky, like this one here, 2010 RF12, it's only eight meters, but I have seen it at the previous close flyby at the Earth when it was bright enough. And then, you know, it does a lot of orbits around the Earth until I predict that it will hit. Uh, but for the large objects, like I say, we do expect that we should have 10 to 20 years. So if really I have something which I need to deflect, we should still have the time to build a deflection mission. Then it's just a question of money. Okay. Thank you. Yes. All right. Bob. I think there is a question from one ah. of my students, Ian. I think ah, he has right. the hand right. up, the virtual hands up. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah. Now I see it. Yes. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, you mentioned the uh, the Nearwise mission. Um, I found that quite interesting. Like being able to reuse a satellite, sorry, a space telescope beyond its primary objective once it can't carry it out. 
uh, for something like this. Um, my question was, um, is this concept something that ESA is also looking at um, with one of its current or retired infrared space telescopes? Uh, what happened so far is that most of our space assets went into what we call an extended mission phase. I think like a uh, cluster I remember was an example which I remember very well because cluster, these were magnetospheric spacecraft, so you wouldn't see asteroids with them, but they were launched before I actually joined the agency. And I was working at the Max Planck Institute then working on the Rosetta mission and the people that were working on cluster were supposed to join my team working on Rosetta. And because this was delayed and extended and extended, they never stopped working and I never got the people. So I was utterly upset that they extended the mission because I wouldn't have the manpower that I would need. So I remember that very well. So that happened, that launched more than 24 years ago. It was supposed to work for a couple of years and it's still there and it's still operational. So I think the answer is we, we normally extend all our missions. Um, what we normally do is we just continue the originally planned program. For example, for XMM, uh, it's an X-ray mission. It's, it's an observatory. So an observatory, you as a scientist, you can ask for observing time. And then there's a selection committee, just like on big astronomical telescopes, ground-based. And if you get the observing time granted, you get your observations. And uh, of course, you can basically request observations of asteroids, and we're doing that with all these space-based telescopes, but we'll always be competing with other communities. Something like NeoWise hasn't happened in Europe yet. NeoWise was a special case because the science was to do an, uh, a very wide spectral range infrared survey and when they ran out of coolant, they had to stop that work. They just couldn't do it anymore. And only the two closest infrared channels where you don't really need the cooling that much were still operational. So for the normal scientists that wanted to use the telescope, the telescope was basically useless, but it was good enough for us. So that's why Neowise is the special case. But like I say, also in Europe, now we do extend our missions and typically they just continue their observations as they do before. Thank you very much. All right, I saw a, a real raised hand by Bob Morris also, if there's no virtual hands. Is there any other question? If, if not, um, I might just ask a quick question myself. Yeah, um, a question. Yeah, ask a question. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, given, given we're sending out spacecraft to distant asteroids, and given that we've got one coming very close in of just a few years' time, uh, are there any planned missions to, to get very close to Apophis? Ah, uh, uh, you asked my same question, Bob. <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, uh, let's see. There is, there is nothing fixed yet. So the answer is no, uh, nothing confirmed. What we do is we're currently pushing a CubeSat mission to Apophis, which could be done on relatively short notice. And I remember there is one spacecraft which was considered to go, and I think it was actually OSIRIS-REx the American sample return mission, they did a study and they think they could, after they separate the, the sample return capsule to, uh, to enter the Earth's atmosphere, they can change the course of the mother spacecraft so that it would end up, I think, doing a flyby at Apophis. And, uh, but there, I don't know any details. I have it on my list to find out more. I just heard that just before Christmas. And then during the Christmas break, I didn't follow that up. So of course, people are thinking about that. And they're even dedicated conferences. There was one in Nice, well, it was virtual in the end in November last year where people discussed this topic. But unfortunately, I'm not aware of anything that has really been approved right now. And I keep saying that this is fantastic. I think Elon Musk should get up and say, I do, uh, you know, what we can do is we can do a picture similar to what you see on the screen that I 
just go to a, to a geostationary transfer orbit, which goes to 36,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface, and Apophis will be at 30,000. So if I time it right, I can actually be behind Apophis as seen from the Earth, and I can take a photograph with Apophis in the foreground and the Earth in the background. I mean, if some private space company could do that, I'm sure they would have a lot of uh, contracts coming up after that. Yeah, so it was exactly my same question. It would be really nice if we can have even a small miniaturized mission to visit Apophis. It would be a nice demonstration. Yeah, tell the politicians, tell them that they need to come up with the money. I mean, we... uh, let, let, let's see what we can do, uh, or our students after they graduate, if yeah. they can influence. <laughs> In any case, thank you so much for uh, your talk. I think it has been very informative and, uh, in my opinion, has kind of show what ESA is doing, and there is much more about uh, asteroid that we probably some of the audience didn't know about and what is it doing to protect us so thank you for your work um, if there are no other questions we can consider this this session over um, if you have um, any further question you can always email me and I will redirect your question later so in the chat you will be able to find my email as well so I hope you enjoy it and uh, I think it was a nice start of 2021 with that TED Talk. So shall we clap a mute and maybe clap our hands to Jeff Jeff? Thank you very much. One, two, and three. Anyway, thank you. Okay, thanks. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. And yeah, so have a safe 2021. We are in lockdown in, in England. So yeah, well, stay safe. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. So in, in the end, I discovered that some of my students couldn't access the link. My bad. <laughs> so okay. yeah, there, there was a password for how I set in our website. I don't know why, but yeah. So they joined later. But this was great because I recorded. So at least I oh, yeah, yeah. can see the, the beginning.